Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, 5073 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And as we continue, continue to hurdle in towards the unknown and getting back into the swing of things, um, it's always invigorating to talk to uh, my next guest, somebody who's always game um, to play music and to take chances and to go for it on the bandstand. And um, and he does it with a lot of grace and um, not a lot of ego. And it's very refreshing uh, because I feel like these are the kind of cats that, um, you know, as we move forward, at least uh, as it relates to my program, what I believe in is that these are the cats that we're going to be leading us into the future of, of live of the live musical experience, uh, having us um, look towards the light and not the dark, and most importantly, uh, inspire people uh, to be themselves. Uh, it's been a long, long 18 months, and my guest is about uh, to get back on the bandstand in the most formal way with his band, The Wise Owls, uh, this weekend. Um, at a, uh, a Tree of Life festival, and uh, thought it would be high time to bring him on the program. Alex Coford, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely, man. I, um, I mean, you know, can you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you feel right now as it relates to, um, I, you know, I feel like one thing that gets lost a lot of the time if you're kind of a creative artist is that you have to feel inspired in order to for that to translate out to the audience. And I was wondering if, you know, if you could talk about a, a source of inspiration for, for you lately. Um, yeah, if I'm being completely honest, my the source of inspiration I found most recently is Farmer Dave. Mm. and uh, i know you know him well and uh but yeah he, there's a community down here since moving to la from the bay area that um i've kind of been lucky enough to fall into and farmer dave is a huge part of that um probably one of the most positive beautiful souls that i could possibly be around so it's hard not to feel inspiration from him I mean, can you, I mean, I, again, I mean, we are like, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a soul brother and I mean, he, he instilled a lot of faith in me. I always th looked at Dave, Farmer Dave as somebody who, um, you know, will always find the, the best part of somebody and, and try to enhance that. I just remember you, I, I remember I ran into you right when you first moved to Los Angeles. I mean, do you do you really feel like you, you were lucky to fall into it? I, I feel like farmer had his eye on you for a long time. I definitely feel lucky. I feel like, uh, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And, uh, I've had a lot of growth, not only from the move and, and just that does something to people when they get out of their comfort zone, but also, you know, there's something to be said about the past year and everything we've all gone through. I know that I personally gained a lot of spiritual growth and uh, it was like sink or swim. So, right. Uh, I definitely, I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. That's very inspiring actually. I mean, can you talk about, I mean, there's a, can you talk about um, the, the, your spiritual growth, especially, I mean, people oftentimes confuse sort of religiosity, dogmatic religion with spirituality, but um how has that manifested for you? Can you give an example of it in the last year, how you've cultivated spirit? Yeah, through gratitude. It's, mm. I guess, the the biggest one, something that I had to learn. Um, but I was gifted Be Here Now, Baba Ram Dass wow. book. Oh, yeah. And, uh, wow. and yeah, that was kind of like my introduction to changing my, my changing my mindset a bit. Um, but it's a collective thing because it comes from a whole community that I was kind of involved in. You know, I, I knew Farmer a little bit. I knew Chris Robinson, um, 
through Terrapin and Phil and Ross James and all that circle. And uh, this pandemic shut the Black Crows down for, from touring, which then enabled Brit at Folkia, um, the promoter, to put together a band, Los Hermanos Cosmico, which um, I was lucky enough to be a part of that. And we did a few shows during this pandemic. So it's like... I have so much gratitude for the, the craziest things right now that I never thought I would um, <laughs> being shut down. The world shut down for the past year, but really I kind of owe it all to that because at the, we played a show at Henry Miller um, sure. library. Yeah, it was a phenomenal Victor. show. Yeah. Yeah. And at that show, Chris's wife, Camille um, actually like bought this book and handed it to me and said, I want to gift you this book. And so I took it home and I kind of took it as like a, a sign that I, I was ready for it at that moment and that I was going to give it my all. And I did, I dove into it. And for a while I got really high from it. And then I started realizing how high I was from it. And then I got real low, <laughs> which is all part of the process that I'm coming to learn. But um, that's where it kind of started. And then, but, but the biggest thing for me is like really kind of just, honing in on gratitude and um, understanding exactly what that means yeah. and that um, there's so many reasons to be grateful. <clears throat> Can you talk uh, about, I think it's fascinating because I've interviewed so many, uh, well, several of uh, Neem Curly Baba's, just, I never got to Ram Dass, but um, can you talk about why the, why did you get low? Because I mean, I guess for me, like I, I always, you know, I don't think I ever, um, have dwelled on things in the past, but if anything, I had anxiety and or angst related to projection into the future, trying to control things or, you know, basically trying to get my hands around stuff before it manifests. And, um, and through the Tao, receiving the Tao, I, it changed me fundamentally a lot. But, I mean, was it, when you got low, was it just sort of the realization that this is a life journey and it's going to take a lot of work? Was it just coming down, like, coming down off, like, after playing, like, an incredible weekend of shows and then, then just sort of sitting back and realizing, like, you don't have another show for two weeks? What was the... Why did you sort of decompress at, at some point after after being high for so long? I um, I recorded an album from when in, and that whole process also contributed to me getting feeling really high from it, and right. just you know. So once that was finished, uh, something about that process kind of um, you know re reality hit, and it it wasn't about me because when you're in the studio you're having fun you're making beautiful music and sounds with your friends and people you want to be around and then you, all of a sudden you're done and uh you're done mixing and it's it comes time for other people to absorb it and decide whether or not they like it meaning you know not even necessarily the public yet but just if you're going to send it out to record labels or you know just your friends to to, to kind of say like hey i made a record what do you think of this and then that's a scary thing for me um, so that kind of contributed to me coming down a bit and then losing sight of the gratitude through that process and kind of feeling more cynical. And um, I just got really depressed. And I, I think that I had lost sight of the spiritual growth that I had gained. And it wasn't, my focus wasn't on that as much. It was more on, it was coming from a more egotistical place of like, I hope people like this. Right. So I want to be clear right. though. I want to be clear though. The, 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 for lack of a better word, you know, just getting low had to do with you anticipating things that you thought, you know, the judgment, no, no one actually ever came to you and said, well, um, you know, this is, you know, warmed over you know garbage nobody ever gave you negative feedback uh you just were dreading that putting it out there putting yourself out there that's right yeah yeah it is i mean that yeah. is uh being out there <clears throat> for lack of a better word just completely naked to the world with your art is like um it's like kind of just like being on a 
slack line or something, which I can't even balance on. But it's just like, I mean, do you, <laughs> did you, can you talk a little bit about if there was a moment when you were just sort of feeling sorry for yourself and you're just like, you know, this is, I have to just be grateful. Health is wealth. I'm able to create in the studio. I've had opportunities to play live with seminal cats. Um, I have a good, I'm blessed to have good family and friends. Like, I mean, what, when did you sort of, because it's always, I mean, it's not like you make progress and then go backward. It's just kind of always there in life as you move forward, two steps forward, three steps back, that kind of stuff. I mean, how did you get out of that, that rut, so to speak? Um, I, it's not a place that I like to go. So I kind of got sick of it. Yeah. The, the self-loathing thing is not, I mean, it's, it's something I'm all too familiar with, but I'm also so sick of it that I, I didn't want to stay there very long. And I knew that. So sometimes when you're in it, it's hard because depressions are real. Thing. Like when you're anxious, I have really bad anxiety and I, I can physically get sick. It's like, I, sometimes I feel like I have the flu I have to realize that you're not sick. You just have anxiety. So I know that these things manifest in physical forms. Sometimes it's hard when you're in the middle of it to snap out and realize, you know, you don't need to be there. But I got a phone call uh, from one of the people I had sent it to someone that I respect very much and uh, was kind of really anxious about um, uh, whether or not they liked it or what they thought of it. And the, the question he asked me had, nothing to do with my album he he was basically like are you okay and uh hmm. so that kind of was like that kind of shook me because it's not i i don't want to put that vibe out and if i'm feeling really low um yeah i mean no i'm not i wasn't okay in that moment but yes i was i am okay i'm not you know there's no like there was no self-harm thoughts or anything like that obviously you know but i was just feeling low and feeling really vulnerable. And so that kind of snapped me out of it. I was like, no, I, you know, he's, this person's absolutely right. right. I cannot be that person. I don't want to be that person. And I'm all too familiar with this. Um, so I need to get back on that spiritual, spiritual journey. Well, I want to be clear. He called and just based on your demeanor on the phone asked you that, or he, or, no, I, I had been around him. I had been around. I him, did. Yeah, out. dude. I mean, I mean, honestly, man, like I, I feel like I'm get I, I get, physically i don't luckily knock on wood i don't get sick but i every day there's a gravitational weight on me of that in the form of anxiety that um does make me think like what's going on like am i getting sick i don't my you know like i I mean it's always there um and yet i know what you mean like at a certain point i've just had a certain point in my life i mean I think having kids is also part of it is like, you know, you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like, you're just like, no, like, I'm not going to freaking like you can live life the rest of your life like this, or you can just be who you are, be your true self and, you know, great, great gratitude or it's hard in the moment, but you're not alone. man. I mean, I, th- I just think that that is something that is, um, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, you know, they may not be completely drastic and check out, but it does dominate their existence. And I think the key really is um, uh, for you, you know, Camille, it's interesting Camille gave you that book. I mean, that it is about being completely in the moment. I mean, that's what the magic of as going to see great music or being on the bandstand is that. I just don't know how you guys come down from that shit. Sometimes, I mean, when, when things are in normal times and like, you're just basically, you know, maybe you play like 10 days straight and there's like three, like insanely amazing shows. I just, it would be, I'd get so high off of that. I don't know how you come back down. And then in this time when the shows are so fleeting, you know, it's just like, there's a lot of space in between. Um, what's your, I mean, what, what, not that you, have everything figured out but i would venture to say that you're probably i mean you're not alone and you're not the only one and there might be some people who haven't had some of the 
luck because let's face it, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And the opportunities that you've had over uh, COVID and what's your advice to people who are in the dark right now, who, who don't see a path forward, at least in the near term, in, for some kind of normalcy as it relates to domestic touring, being able to survive as a musician, what would you say to them? Because I know that there are many cats that are maybe on the surface, they're putting out a good vibe, but they're all suffering then. I say it's okay to suffer. I mean, that's the human condition, right? We're all, we're all prone to suffering and that's part of being, you know, being alive and um, there's beauty in that. So if there's a way to feel all right with suffering and grief and all these other things that we have to deal with on this, you know, human plane, um, that that's cool. That's all part of it. So, you know, but obviously don't get caught up in, um, in your anxieties or stuff, because you're right. It, it is, it is looking into the future or the past. And, and if we take it like a, a deep breath and realize that, in this exact moment, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting here, you're okay. Like a lot of those things drift away. The anxiety <laughs> right. tends to disappear, you know? That's so exactly right. yeah. Focus on this exact moment and you, understand that there's beauty in some of the stuff that we've gone through. You think it's also important for cats to like, I think there's such a stigma attached to this stuff that we're talking about. Um, your friend, whoever it was, just was like, are you okay? He didn't even focus on the album. And do you think that it's important for cats to be vulnerable enough to express it uh, to not just family and friends, but, you know, I mean, to get to talk about it, get it out of your system? Is, is that something that is therapeutic for you f- from time to time? I just feel like the stigmas, people have to let go of that stuff, you know? Yeah, I think we're getting closer to that. I don't. I don't necessarily feel like we're there yet. I know that. Yeah. Um, in the last like year, especially or a few years, it feels like we, mental health has become a huge topic. That we're it's becoming mainstream. We're starting to accept it as a real thing and um, normalize it, which is good. But I still don't think we're exactly where we need to be, which is also okay. Um, talking about it is good, but I think. Um, yeah, more so, yeah, if that's what you need to do, get it off, you know. If that's how it helps, definitely talk about it. There's no harm in that. Um, everyone's different, though, you know. Some people need to go backpacking by themselves and be alone and just sit with their thoughts for a while, and some people need to sit down and have a three-hour conversation with someone and unload, so. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever yeah. works. I mean, what, 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 what like, uh. I see, you know, uh, if you watch an NFL game or something, you might see some commercials uh, encouraging, quote unquote, men to, you know, talk about. I agree that it's becoming more mainstream. When do you think we, when will, what are the sort of foundations that will tell you that we are where we need to be with it? Because we're not there yet. I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, we're still dealing with civil rights issues and women's rights issues and so we have a long way to go in a lot of different places like it's not just mental health but the good thing is that we're getting somewhere with mental health it's becoming one of these things that we're talking about um so it's hard to say for me what what would be the thing to see to know that we're there um i guess maybe the better question is what 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 was the if you could talk about one thing in 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 be here now that that has just stuck with you and that you rely, what is the, what was something that you, I mean, sure there were many things, but um, what was the sort of the, the, the overarching thing that, that, you know, fundamentally there was Alex Colford before Ram Dass be here now. And then there's Colford now. Well, I think um, understanding that it's a journey and so if you start feeling like we're there or you're there spiritually, um, you're missing sight of, you know, the whole journey and that there's, there's constant growth. It's a lifelong thing. Or, you know, for, if we're talking about mental health, I would think it's probably a continued conversation. We may never get there, but as long as we're continuing to do the work, we're doing everything we can and we're moving in the right direction. Um, 
that's how I feel with being here now in spirituality. It's like I, I, I'm taking the pressure off of feeling like one day I'm going to wake up enlightened and have the answers and just understand that like I'm choosing this because this is what I want for myself and my mind and I want that peace. So I'm going to continue to work on that. I just want to, before we move on, I just want to ask you about, have you um, free associate on this one word? Cause that, this is what gets me in trouble. I just want you to riff on impatience. Can you talk about impatience? Like that to me is, um, like you said, eat, fall into the journey. It's the forever journey, but that requires patience. And so yeah. I, I, I have a tendency to be, um, my impatience with myself and, or the trajectory of my spiritual path is frustrating. Sometimes it's, it's actually kind of lessened during COVID because we've all been restricted so much physically. And, but, um, can you talk about, um, uh, because, uh, aspiration, the enemy of, uh, the the en- the enemy of aspiration is impatience. So I just wanted you to talk about that. Yeah, I'm. I definitely am an impatient person. I can fall into that a lot. So I'm not sure I I can talk too much on <laughs> you know what, what the answer is. Yeah, no, um, I did. I mean, you have well, how how have you learned to? You think the this time off? I mean, I don't know. Every it looks different with everybody, but you feel like some of these things that you were working on. Um, it's been, it's been easier to work on just because we, you know, normalcy, especially for a, uh, road dog musician is just, it just, it stopped. Do you think it's, that helped a little bit? I think so because it's been, you know, it's like, it's forced you to take the magnifying glass inward. So if like for me, all this downtime there's been enough, it's been so long that there's been so many different um, peaks and valleys that I've had the opportunity to not think about it and kind of just be at first, you know, it was great. I was able to sit at home and, you know, do what I've wanted to do for a long time and not have any worries. And, and then you get sick of that and uh, start to miss your friends and miss live music and all those things. And then it's just like constant up and down, but, sometimes in those like down moments, it's been good for me to actually like take the magnifying glass and look at the, the things that are um, causing me to feel those ways. Cause there's no other way to deal with it. If, if you're not, if you're not. Um, right. No, you're right. If you're, if you're avoiding you know, it or the, like pretending not. Yeah. If you, it, it, it's painful in the moment, but then I think you learn, you just grow internally uh, spiritually. If you're able to yeah. do that, that that's the key though. I mean, um, you think that the book maybe helped you look, take that magnifying glass and really look inside before maybe you didn't as much. I think that that's probably the biggest crisis in, uh, with, with human animals these days is just projection of self loathing grievance on other people, as opposed to doing the interior, uh, looking glass, so to speak. I have no doubt that the book helps me and I have no doubt that the book found me when I was ready for the book. And I believe that wholeheartedly because I wouldn't have been in a place before this year to actually like sit down and internalize and continue to internalize the messages in the book. It's so beautiful. Um, talking to Alex Colford here. Great, great to hear this, this guy's voice as always. We have a, a, a game on this program called name that voice. I don't expect you to know who it is, but uh, it's definitely pertinent content. So take a listen and then we'll uh, come back. Maybe I can just do it best by describing what a recording session was like, as opposed to, you know, come on up here and we'll fix it. Mm -hmm. It was all about pre-production, not post-production. When we did the band's Big Pink album, for instance, we took every song and said, well, how can we better this song, how can we better this section, what's appropriate for this section, how do these instruments fit together, uh, you know, how do the voices fit, what, 
and that, and let's get it so we can play it great. And then once we got got it so we can play it great, we just practice it over and over and over and over again, and then we're ready to to uh, roll the tape. But uh, that's not that doesn't seem to be. The, I mean, I thought I spent too much time in recording studios with bands who didn't have it together and who spent time. Uh, in front of the microphone, you know, wasting everyone's money and time while they practiced. So it was all about pre-production and not post-production. Alex, that was um, my interview with um, great producer John Simon, who did the um, uh, the Earl, Big Pink and the Brown album. He did Seals and Crofts, Taj Mahal. <clears throat> great player and producer. And I really... You know, you talked on the back end about, um, you know, being in the studio, having a ball with your friends, hearing sounds, playing off each other, and then sort of relinquishing creative control to other forces, other people, uh, quote unquote, uh, specialists and things like that. Can can you talk about your own philosophy? I mean, I, th- I have a big problem. I mean, you listen to those albums. um I mean, Seals and Cross is a great example. Like, they worked out those harmonies in pre-production, and they were really great musicians. But they were, con- you know, songs like Hummingbird and Diamond Girl, like that. Those are sophisticated three-part, you know, maybe more harmonies, and they had very interesting ways of figuring it out in pre-production. And once they hit the record button, that's it. Like, I mean, there was very minimal overdubbing, very minimal post-production. And what I hear in a lot of modern recorded music today is it doesn't matter how good the the lyrics, how good the 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 messages are or the groove, um, everything has been. There's so many layers on the back end that it seems to really suck a lot of the soul out of the music. And I, you know, before we get into actually talking about this album, what is your philosophy as it relates to pre-production versus post-production? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm sure it'll change every album. Um, I do a lot of demos on my own where I build everything myself and send it around to the band. And that's usually the introduction long before the, the studio. That's just the introduction to them learning the song and kind of getting the vibe of what I'm looking for. So I kind of have that approach when I'm sitting in my house uh, recording from home where I build everything. Um and then taking it into the studio, it's like, um, at least for, for this current album, it, it was, uh, it was a, a lot more along the, that approach that you were just talking about where we, we did very minimal overdubs. We did it live as a band. We tracked it live. Um, and everything, you know, it's like, we didn't have a huge production. We just, we, we made the album and that's not, I'm not saying that that's the way I'm going to work forever because I do want to, experiment with other ways of doing this but uh that's how we did this one it it feels really good oh it's great um, but it's I, great i gotta be honest that's part of the reason you know that um i started feeling a little anxious or second guessing things because when you go that route it's not the common way to do things in modern day recording so it's like you kind of stick out like a sore thumb where you're not you know there's only so much you can do when you hit the tape that's what you get. And like, um, it's hard to compare, compare your modern day record to everything else that's coming out nowadays and everything's so perfect. And, um, this album that I made is just not, well, I mean, dude, Colford, you're making my day, dude, because you're just talking about, um, conform conforming to the trends of society versus not. I mean, can you talk about sticking out like a sore thumb? Like to me, you know, I don't care if it's I interview David Spinoza, who played the guitar solo on Right Place, Wrong Time with Dr. John or <clears throat> Louis Shelton on Last Train to Clarksville with the Monkees. <clears throat> These guys literally hit clams in the middle of the song and it was kept and those songs became radio. They became hits. I mean, I can you talk about um, because imperfection is perfection. And I, a lot of, a lot of cats, I don't, I just don't understand this need. 
I guess the technology has advanced so much that people just crave it, but I don't understand this need for perfection because when you perfect everything, I can't feel anything. I, there's no soul in it. I, and I don't quite understand why people can't feel that. Or, I mean, that's just the way I feel. Do you, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> when you talk about first tracking everything in your, on your own and then sending it out to the band, what, when, when you say the kind of vibe, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I mean, because to me, to me, if you set that tone in, in the, in the early stages, then when you come into the studio, you're going to be able to hit first or second take done. Yeah. And it's always different because it's not, um, it, you have human beings that are putting their spin on it. So it's never exactly the same as, as the demo I produce, but, but the vibe is important to me. And what I mean by that is like instrumentation or a certain amount of space in certain parts mm. um, where, where the song gets bigger, where it dips down, um, where there should be harmonies, where there shouldn't, you know, those are the things that I map out pretty much immediately when I'm writing a song. Um, and then it develops a little bit, but usually not too much, um, depending on the players. But yeah, it, it does help a lot. I think it helps a lot going into the studio because you get the right people, which I feel like I have a good group of people that I've been playing music with for a while and we've, uh, we've grown a lot together. And so it does make it easy to get in there and get one, two or three, you know, three takes and be done. Um, and then call it good. Uh, you know, this record we made, we did it in five days, like total, which is kind of unheard of. I mean, it's not unheard of. No, I mean, dude, it, I mean, it, it's, it's not unheard of because because cats were making, the studio sharks, I mean, they were making four records a day. They didn't have time. You know, it was so much yeah. work back then. But yeah, I get it. That was short. Five days. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not I'm not trying to like... Um, You're right. No, dude, record. dude, in, in, in today's modern world, that's like 20 seconds. So, I mean, it's it's short. Yeah, there's a lot of time that's spent on on the post production, and uh, yeah. So I guess we, I guess this one was we spent a little more time on the pre. I love it. No, <laughs> let me, I mean, so that well, I think the quote continued. The <clears throat> John continued on. He did say that you know, like the band, for instance. I mean, they practice a lot. I mean, they they would. Again, I I have a hard time with that the R word rehearsal, but at the same time. They would shed the tunes before they hit record. Would you say that once you gave them the the the, the rest of the cats in the band, sort of the what you did at home, um, that you would spend some time jamming up the tunes, in, you know, practicing them before you would record them, or would you just literally maybe only a couple times uh, and then just and just go for it? Well, the good thing with this this album is um it's a continuation of experiences knowledge and, and just like you know time hours spent on stage at terrapin crossroads which is where we all met the people in this project so mm. um that band that is it's almost a continuation of my old band colonel and the mermaids which um we spent a lot of time working together and we spent a lot of time playing music so some of this you know, there were some older tunes that made it onto this record. And then there were some new tunes that I wrote in the last year, you know, when we were all isolated that everyone just picked up on pretty quickly because there's years of history. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a ton of history, but it's been five, six, seven years of playing together and getting to know wh who we are as musicians and people. And uh, so it comes together a lot easier. So that's that's a good thing. This is just... Um, it's, I, I'm thinking of it as like the next evolution um, to my previous band. Um, that's beautiful. I mean, uh, well, the, that telepathy of and that experience and trust is a beautiful thing. I mean, what did, I mean, because we all know, like, chances are if everybody's kind of locked in on that same frequency um, and you have a lot of trust together, you know, that first or second take – are all the tunes kind of first and second takes? Uh, it's, I, I don't want to, like, give you false information. But <laughs> it's all right, all dude. You can make it. No, a bunch yeah. of them are, though. I, I know. That's I so freaking cool. Yeah. 
I think I, I'd say a good majority of the tunes on the record are within three takes. Yeah. yeah just, you know, like, I mean, have you being that in the past, how can you just talk as an accompanist, not as a leader, the feeling if it's, you know, maybe adjective is, I don't know what the right adjective, powerless or vexing, frustrated. Just, can you just talk as an accompanist, as a drummer, whatever, as a guitar player, when you're doing somebody's album and when the final edit, you know, I mean, mixing or whatever that word means, when the final mix comes out and you're like, I don't even, that doesn't even sound like us or like that doesn't even sound like what the intensity of the, I mean, what is that feeling? What was that feeling like? Because I have to assume being that you're going against the trends of our time that you've had experiences in other situations when uh, the post-production altered the essence or the vibe of what the music of that group was about. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard thing to um, come to terms with for me, uh, because it's one of those things where you constantly feel like this is what people are basing their whether or not they like you as a musician off mm-hmm. of. These are the records, the sound that they're deciding, and pretty much those decisions are made almost immediately. I would say, like when I listen to a record, I I immediately know if it's something. When the needle drops, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm into this. Or like, "Mm, maybe this isn't for me. And sometimes it's a slow burn and it grows on you. But a lot of times I would say it's, you know, pretty much immediately if you're into it. So that's tough. Um, But that's also not something that I think. I think that when, when you're in the studio and you're recording and you have this idea of what your sound is and, um, a producer or or an engineer or other people in the band have more say than you and you you end up getting not what you necessarily wanted at the beginning out of the project sometimes that can be a really like beneficial thing because i mean if you're if you're not willing to give up the um you know the uh control then that's like it's pretty much pretty brutal but if you do end up giving up control sometimes like a lot of perspective comes from that and you start realizing, well, obviously I don't know everything just because I had this sound in my head or idea of what I wanted the music to be. doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best thing for this album or this song. And it's pretty egotistical to get caught up in your own BS, you know, um, and not be a team player. So that's something I'm trying to carry over into everything I'm going to do moving forward. It's just, it's not necessarily about me at all. And if it's, you know, if it's a sound on a record, I don't like, you know, is it something that really is going to be a deciding factor in whether or not people like the record? And that's a question that I have to ask myself, you know? And it's a question Most you're people, not going to, you, you know, it's only, you know, you just have to get out of your own way in that sense, because um, you're just speculating off of that based on, you know, I don't think anybody's going to come up to you and be like, yeah, you didn't really sound like Alex Coford on that record. It's just, it's more, I mean, to me, I just, I was going back, <laughs> it was Dan Healy's birthday last week. And I was like going back and, 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 and watching this, this, this video interview I did with him in Marin County. And, you know, he was talking about the early days of the, of the dead, maybe even not even early, just continuing on where, um, and it wasn't necessarily the dead. He did a lot of sound for a lot of people. Um, and it wasn't necessarily in the studio. It might have been more of a live setting. But he said if you're if you're going to the to the to the nth degree of the creative arts as a band like the creative uh, Grateful Dead were, you know, if, if you start getting, um, you know, if you if you get out of your your lane, so to speak, as a musician, and you start dictating or worrying about the sound or how your instrument sounds or the collective sound, and instead of letting the other people do what they are intended to do, then you're taking your focus off of that incredibly creative art form. And I just think that that, um, you know, it's very hard. He just he just said at a certain point, I think Garcia might have been coming up and sort of hemming and hawing about it, and he's like, you stick to playing, I'll stick to engineering, you know, and... I feel like, did you have any kind of, the wrong, control is the wrong word. Did you, in terms of delegating responsibility, 
Um, do, do you feel like you allowed those people um, to have some creative control over the outcome of it? Was it hard for you to, or was, and, and was it hard sometimes for you to not put your two cents in there? Um, yeah, I mean, I had a really good, at least for this current album, I had a really good team of people and uh, we all know how to work with each other really well. I mean, Dave schools produced it and I've worked with Dave multiple times um, at this point. Yes. And there's also like a really good solid foundation and friendship uh, above anything else. So that, um, that helps a lot. I think that we were able to communicate in a really good way. I was able to get my stuff across. He was able to, you know, like he, we can talk to each other. That's an important thing. And there's trust there. That's right. Um, so, yeah. Me- it's, meaning it's, me- was, me- 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 like real talk, you know, like you can push back on him and, yeah. and, and at the end of the day, there's no, nobody's has hurt feelings. You guys are just telling you, you can be truthful about it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we can, we have pretty uh, meaningful conversations that have nothing to do with the record. So why can't I carry on into the record? You know, <sighs> well, that's, um, that's a very Ram Dassian quote right there. I mean, um, <laughs> What, so, I, I mean, let me ask you, like, this Alex Coford and the Wise Owls performing this weekend, can you give um, a little bit of insight about, um, even though um, the record, I don't think, has been released, a lot of people haven't heard the record, are, are you, you know, again, taking a page out of the methodology of the, of the um, sort of the, the jazz aesthetic related to rock music i mean are you are you gonna play the tunes the way they are recorded on the record or are have you are have you guys already pinpointed areas of certain tunes that allow for uh things to uh stretch out yeah there's always a bit of stretching i mean with this uh i'm kind of in a mindset lately where less is more. So I'm not, I'm not trying to do any crazy 30 minute jams or, you know, what this isn't a jam band, mm-hmm. um, but I'm from that community where I was, you know, like being almost developed as a musician from Phil and in that jam band world where that's what I learned. So there, my heart is always torn between two different ideas and I write songs. So I don't write a song with the purpose of like, you know, inserting a 15 or 20 minute jam in the middle of it. I write a song and uh, that's the focus. And I feel very good about that because I can't fight who I am as a songwriter and a musician. But there are certain moments in a show, in a live setting, and it really is a, it depends on the environment you're in. Um, I, I expect that this weekend we'll do a little bit of stretching, but you know, it won't be too much. Um, we're going to play a set and stretch out on a few songs that make sense to stretch out on. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think over time, like, that's, you know, if you even look back at, um, I forget the name of that, Long Strange Trip, I forget whatever album it is, but, uh, you know, like playing in the band is four minutes and 25 seconds, and then over time, you know, it, it reveals itself that, oh, this is a logical place where we can stretch out. But you are a singer-songwriter at heart. I mean... Can you talk a little bit about um, the germ of a, of a song for you or even one particular tune on this album that you can talk about, like where the, um, you know, where the germ of the song kind of emanated from? Does it just come through you at, uh, at one full time? Does it come in parts? Uh, how do you, how do you, um, how do you cultivate a, a song? There's a song on this album called Take Flight. Um, it, it was written, uh, about Neil Casal, who I had after Neil passed, I had, uh, a bunch of dreams. And in, in one of the dreams that I had of Neil, he, we were talking and, uh, going over, like we were singing together in the dream. Um, and I said to him, man, I wish I could sing with you again. And he, and he kind of just kind of shrugged it off and laughed and said, well, 
yeah, we're, we're way past that now. <laughs> um, if that's over. Uh, mm. So one of the, you know, like I took some of that dream. I wrote a song about Neil because I felt like that's what I wanted to do. And um, I wanted to honor him in some way. So one of the lines in, in the song is he said, it's over. We cannot sing that anymore. And that came directly from the dream. So uh, I guess that's like, probably for me, that's the most meaningful moment on the record because it came from a real, I, you know, it's, for me, it feels like a very cosmic place. The dreams were so real. Um, felt like we were actually talking and communicating from different, you know, planes and, uh, yeah. Well, that's I mean, let me, I mean, let's be clear though. I mean, those, I mean, some, most dreams, manifest from things that were that really happened so i mean can you trace back the um early memory of of you and neil you know working on vocal harmonies a terrapin or i mean because that must have probably gone down right i mean you guys did work on singing together yeah i was so intimidated by neil to be honest that i kind of was a shy 21 year old kid of course um and his record sweet in the distance had just come out but recently I just went back. Um, also those, those years are a little bit hazy for me because I was indulging and I was a 21 year old, um, playing music with people for the first time, really. So it was kind of a hazy time in my life. I don't, but, yeah, um, of course. I went back recently and watched a bunch of videos where Neil, uh, in 2013 or something played with my, my old band, American Jubilee or the band I was in. And we did, uh, one of his songs, um bird with no name no it was a neat shelter and i was watching that video and i i don't think we ever went over the harmonies i think i just really loved that record and um so i knew all the harmonies so in the video i watched you can see um on the last chorus neil has a you know it's a different word different words for the last chorus and i sang the right words in harmony with him and you see him turn around and smile and give me a big nod. And like those are, the, uh, I love it. It just means the world to me, you know, cause, uh, I wish I could go back and I felt this way since the time he passed, but I, I really wish I could have just expressed to him how much I actually looked up to him and his songwriting, you know, connected with me and just him as a human. It's just like you were drawn. If you knew Neil, you were around Neil, you were drawn to him. You had that. So, I wish I could have uh, expressed how much I actually loved him. Instead, I was embarrassed, you know. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but, but I mean, we are dealing with, I mean, you are fully in, I mean, Ram Dass's guru teacher was uh, named Curly Baba. And, um, you know, he, uh, he was uh, somebody who was completely of cosmic intelligence and, you know, Ram Dass, uh, you know, gave him four four hits of acid that would have put somebody on the moon. It didn't phase him. Uh, and I think the point is that, um, you know, I can speak from my own experience that, um, yeah, you'll never be able to face to face in this life, be able to express that, but there's no reason why you can't, uh, continue to talk to him, um, you know, in, in the different realms, because he absolutely is, his spirit is still, here and i mean i've been on the i've been done interviews with people and i haven't even been you know totally unsolicited and they bring up neil and their own relationship with him and the next thing you know they're on a farm in we're talking and they're in the backyard and somewhere in tennessee and they're like oh my god a heart is forming in the clouds you know you can't make this stuff up i mean it really is like my feeling is whatever whatever you want to express to him it's meaningful because other people have you know, that have been very close to him. I remember t- doing an interview with Aaron Spursky and, and he, you know, the, the dreams that, he, that, that he had, he had an all night thing, a dream about Neil and it, he was, Neil was not in a good place. Not necessarily psychologically, but he was in like a hell realm. And at a certain point, Spursky's like, Hey man, like, yo, let's get out of here. Like, you know, and like, how do you get out of here? And Neil's like, I'll show you. And so they get to this door and they open it. There's like an off, there's like a ramp, like a loading ramp to get out. And Spursky runs out the door and he turns around. He goes, aren't you coming? And Neil's like, no, I can't, I can't leave, man. 
And I, I would just venture to say you want to go on your back porch, do it quietly, silently, out loud. Tell him how you feel. He still can hear it. He's still around. Yeah. No, I, and I mean, it's it I sucks do. that he's gone. I mean, you, uh, I think, I just think that it's it's um, more than anything else. I just feel badly that um, he was unable to ask for help because um, because you know he's just physically he's missed on this on this plane. You know. No doubt. Um. Now. Um, can we, can we, I, 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 unfortunately I cannot make it this weekend. I would, I would love to, um, what, what is, do you have other, um, wise owl gigs on the books? What, like, what is the Coford schedule? Um, not that we're projecting into the future. Um, cause I know you're fully focused on this weekend, but are there other things, um, like that you can uh, put your finger on in terms of uh, collaborative uh, efforts in a in a musical setting. That anything going on in the, in the in the in the in the coming weeks? Not in the coming weeks. I mean, there's intentions. Yep. After after we get past this weekend, my intention is to start buckling down. I'm fully vaccinated. I know the other guys in my band are pretty much there as well. So. Um, the time is the time has come. I think I'm sure ready to hit the road as long as uh, you know we're we're able to. Um, so you know my conversations that need to be had in the next few weeks are really kind of focused on what the next step is for the album, um, release date, getting all that stuff sorted out, and then hitting the road. And I want to tour with this band, and I want to come to your town and. Everyone, dude, we need you. Know, you we need you in Tucson immediately, dude. Man, I will be there. I just need to, uh... <laughs> we'll be. No, I mean, let me let me just. But uh, you know, I, I just want to let you know. I mean, I'll, I'll hit you up before, but uh, I'm I'm fully vaxxed and uh, I'm ready to hit the road. I'm just I'll be out in your uh, in 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 the L.A. area like the the 14th through the 18th. So if as long as you haven't hit the road already, I mean, I'd love to. You know do a do an interview with you and uh and and bla- blow it out to the world man and and uh and and keep them i mean i'm ready to rock and roll man i i'm a little bit um i mean it's just been so i'm just so ready to to sort of just you know marinate in this stuff again and and i realize that everybody's kind of dealing with trepidation a little post-traumatic disorder from this whole thing but um yeah i would love to connect with you in person when i get out to la I'll be here, man. I would love that. And just talk to just before. Yeah, it would be. I mean, congratulations on the album. Congratulate. Can you talk a little bit about this gig? It's not. In fact, I think it's kind of refreshing. It's. Um, it's not. I mean, can you just talk about how people can can get tickets to it or where it's going to be at? Like a little, and what what day you're playing, all that kind of stuff. We're doing uh, Sunday, May 23rd. That's this Sunday, and it's in Johnson Valley, California, which is um, it's pretty pretty much. I, I guess if you want to picture where it is, it's Joshua Tree. Mm-hmm. That's, I guess closest. Uh, you you know I don't know exactly what I'm saying. Joshua Tree is how you could picture it. Yeah, it's um, landmark. That's so landmark. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna do a show. It's gonna be an all day. Basically, it's turned into a festival a one-day festival with a bunch of beautiful friends. It just so happens to be Farmer Dave's birthday. So, um, oh, that's that right. I, that's right. Okay, so that's Farmer's birthday on that Sunday. On that Sunday. Oh, that's great. So uh, it's going to be a really beautiful time. We're all going to have fun. And the people that are coming already, I know, are beautiful people. Um, you can get tickets at Skull and Bones. Produ- or, let me make sure I'm not putting you the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah, please. Skull and Bones. I'll type it in real quick just to double check. Do it. Skull and Bones Music dot com. Um, and they, you know, there's a there's multiple shows when you go to that website, but you'll see ours May twenty third, Tree of Life in Joshua Tree. Um, you can click on that link, buy your ticket, and. Uh, 
the tickets are, are $100, and I know that's a big ask, but if you buy the $100 ticket, we're going to give you a VIP package, um, whether that's signed posters, future tickets to a show, you know. Um, I just want quality time with everybody in the band, you know. <laughs> well. No, but dude, that is – see, but, okay, but that's a whole other – all the wax we got to get into but uh yeah man the, the i mean coming out of this thing <coughs> excuse me i'm a little bit i mean with the uh i just want to be clear is it a is it like a are there really any capacity restrictions on this or or yeah there We're is capping it at 100 people because i think we'll probably have a few guests um i think ordinance would be 200 without a permit permit and we're not going to we're not going to push that so 100 people is what we're selling 100 tickets um that's where we're capping it there are still tickets available we haven't hit that number yet um but it's going to be safe protocols are covid protocols are in place um yeah i mean it's yeah. just kind of, Go ahead. we're set to have a beautiful time i look forward to connecting with you in a few weeks i mean please uh Send my love to all the beautiful people that will be on the bandstand with you and, and other times and uh, appreciate what you stand for, what you do, and uh, and we'll get the uh, get the ball rolling real soon, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, man. Much yeah, dude, I'm I love where your head's at, man. And listen, you know what? If it gets dark or down again, just roll with it because that's what this is about, man. And and the idea of trying try- what's that? That's what we do. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, just don't be hard on yourself. Like, just know that everybody is in that madness. And then when you find yourself at peace, stop and think of Ramnas and be here now. So rock on, man. Great to hear you, Colford. Much love. All right. Take care. Peace. Great to hear that cat. One of the young lions. We'll be back with Eric Mercury part two after this.